steadfast love and faithfulness. Listen to the Son of God, showing us how to live, love, and serve. Listen to the Spirit of God, revealing God's call in our lives. Let us worship God.
praise and confession. Loving God, we are thankful that you humbled yourself to live among us, joyful that you chose us to be your companions, amazed that you stick by us, for we often struggle sticking by you. Gracious God, open the deep down eyes of every heart that we might see you. May we see your compassion that created us, your imagination that bound us together, your justice that shapes our future, your word that calls us to be, your healing that recreates each day, your forgiveness that transforms who we shall be, your spirit that redefines who we are, your hope that never lets us go. And as you reveal your presence to us, may our actions reveal your light to the world. Amen. Friends, our prayers are accepted. Our lives are forgiven. Christ is revealed to us, and with all we recognize our incredible value in God's love. We are forgiven. Alleluia. Amen. chose his apostles, those among his followers who would also become teachers and leaders. He continued to travel and teach. And all along the way, he revealed more of who he is, which is also a way of revealing more about God and what God desires from God's people. Listen for the word of God for you today from Luke chapter 7. After Jesus had finished all his sayings <clears throat> in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. A centurion there had a slave whom he valued highly and who was ill and close to death. When he heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders to him, asking him to come and heal his slave. When they came to Jesus, they appealed to him earnestly, saying, he is worthy of you, having you do this for him, for he loves our people. It is he who built our synagogue for us. And Jesus went with them. <clears throat> but when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you, but only speak the word and let my servant be healed. For I also am a man set under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes. I say to another, come, and he comes. And to my slave, do this, and the slave does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd that followed him, he said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. When those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the slave in good health. Soon afterward, he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went with him. <clears throat> As he approached the gate of the town, a man who had died was being carried out. He was his mother's only son, and she was a widow, and with her was a large crowd from the town. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion for her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came forward and touched the bier, and the bearers stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, rise. 
The dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us, and God has looked favorably upon his people. The word about him spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. These two encounters with Jesus are fascinating, especially in juxtaposition with one another. One involves a man with power and influence, not only among the Jews, but also in the Roman army. The other, a widow, who was left with no standing, no support, much less influence after the loss of her son. One conversation starts with the assumption of healing. The other with the resignation with which we are all too well acquainted, as we have had our own dealings with death. The centurion has heard of Jesus and sends the Jewish elders to ask him to come and heal one of his slaves. I find it intriguing that the elders take it upon themselves to let Jesus know how generous this centurion is. Luke doesn't indicate that he included his love for the Jewish people in his message to Jesus. In fact, as Jesus approaches, a second message arrives saying, don't come in, I'm not worthy. Here's a man who could have demanded Jesus to come, could have demanded that he come and see the slave. For that matter, he could have just replaced the slave should the servant have died. But instead, he describes Jesus' authority and power to heal, and he trusts that authority and power, even from afar. He had faith, just as it would be described later in that letter to the Hebrews, the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. He articulated that faith in very practical, very human terms, because as a man who worked within that chain of command, he understood power and authority in very practical, tangible ways. And that understanding allowed him to believe that all he needed was a word from Jesus. Just a word would heal the slave that he valued so highly. Jesus heard faith in that man's message, never questioning his faith's origins. He healed the slave and he bore witness to the centurion's faith. Once again, we are reminded that as the Son of God, Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth to do the work of healing and so much more. And we're reminded that his mission field is not solely among the Jews. Now, it seems like we just kind of turn the corner in Capernaum and run into a funeral procession, but Jesus and his followers have actually moved on to Nain. And it's almost like we've got two parades happening. Jesus and his large crowd of followers, they might as well have been carrying signs and running floats representing life and hope and joy. They are hyped up after a series of miraculous healings and brilliant teachings. How sobering it must have been to meet a very different procession at the gate. The widow, her dead son, a crowd of mourners showing all the signs of death, despair, and sorrow. This time, no one approaches Jesus. No one makes any request. This time, Jesus sees what is happening, and he is moved to respond. He is moved by compassion. True compassion is not an intellectual exercise. The kind of compassion that Jesus experienced is as fully human as it is fully divine. Compassion is one of those feel it in your gut emotions. In fact, the Greek root for the word that is translated as compassion here is schwachna. Literally, intestines. 
When Jesus sees what is happening, he experiences that same deep, gut-wrenching compassion that moves us to act. You know that twist in your belly. It comes with the music and the pictures of neglected animals in those commercials for the Humane Society. And we know the even deeper wrenching when the faces etched with suffering are human. Jesus saw the woman and knew what was happening. There was no husband, no son, no male kin there to console and to mourn with her. He saw the woman and knew this meant she was now among the most vulnerable in the community, given the patriarchal structure of the Jewish people. He saw the woman and knew that he had the power and the authority to change what he knew in his gut was not good. He told her not to weep. And he told the young man to get up. And thus, Jesus reveals that he has the power not only to heal, but to raise the dead to life. Makes sense. If Jesus is who he claims to be, the son of an all-powerful God should be equally powerful. But notice, Luke presents us with a deity who wields that power in ways specifically designed to affirm and give life. Think about this. Think about the ways that we experience people with power. Power in the form of leadership, wealth, influence, control. History is rife with evidence supporting the aphorism about power corrupting people, and the more power they gain, the more corrupt they become. But where does God with us appear? Luke started telling the story of Jesus' story with people preparing us for a Messiah who would turn things upside down, a Messiah who would bring down the mighty and lift up those who had been kept low. Jesus begins his life at the bottom of the ladder, and he stays right there among those at the lowest rungs. That is the kind of leader he is. Here in chapter 7, we begin to see Jesus acting in ways that indeed reverse fortunes. When Jesus sees the widow and his gut twist, he liberates her from a dire situation by bringing her son back to life. When Jesus hears the faith of the centurion, he heals a slave. Okay, that one, it's not nearly as satisfying really. I wanted the story to end with a captive set free from slavery because that was part of the deal, right? He came to feed, to clothe, to set the captive free. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's great that this man is healed. And I'm hopeful that a man who seems humble and values this slave highly will treat the man well. But even after the miracle, Jesus' work seems unfinished. Perhaps at some point, the centurion finishes that work, releasing the slave. After all, he had faith. It's certainly possible that he kept tabs on this Jesus and heard more about his teaching and offered release to this man that he valued as a person and not any longer as property. It's a possibility. It's a very optimistic <laughs> possibility. But I believe that Compassion moves us fully human people, not just messiahs. And maybe that's the point. As people who believe in Jesus, as people who trust in God's power to enter into our world and transform it, and as people who understand the fullness of God's kingdom is yet to come, we must accept that there will always be work for us to engage, for us to complete. Our challenge is to see it amidst all the distractions of this world and to overcome cynicism that freezes our guts and blunts our compassion. And here's the thing, 
We don't have a choice. That work, that work is part of who we are. God doesn't claim us or save us so we sit back and wait till it's time to punch our ticket and hop onto a train that's bound for glory. Not anymore than God watches and waits for us to slip up and sin so that those tickets are null and void. Dear ones, hear and believe this truth. You are loved because God is love. And not a thing in this world can change that. You and I, we are never going to be powerful enough to change that love. You are loved beyond reason by the God who created and claims you. Not because you made a choice. Not because you do more good things than bad. Not because you said a prayer sometime back when or joined in the prayer confession today. You are forgiven because God extends grace. You are saved because the work of Christ was done in his living and dying and rising. And how can you know this to be true? On those days when you are out and about in this very broken world. You will feel it in your gut. You'll feel it in your guts every time you see someone bowed down under the weight of grief. You'll experience in your swachna as you hear of and see injustice carried out, especially when injustice is carried out in the name of the very one who embodied justice. That roar of righteous anger and compassion in your ears and in your guts is all the evidence you need that Christ has saved you and thus is saving the world from a life lived for self from a life lived chasing earthly treasures that my dear ones is my prayer for you for me for us this day and every day that our eyes would be open and that our guts would be gripped by the depth of need that we see in this world and that the light of the world would shine brightly in and through the work that we do. May it be so. Amen. Let's say what we believe together using words adapted from the Confession of 1967. God's sovereign love is a mystery beyond the reach of the human mind. Human thought ascribes to God superlatives of power, wisdom, and goodness. But God reveals divine love in Jesus Christ by showing power in the form of a servant, wisdom in the folly of the cross, and goodness in receiving sinful men and women. The power of God's love in Christ to transform the world discloses that the Redeemer is the Lord and Creator who made all things to serve the purpose of God's love. Please join me in our responsive prayers for the community and the world. Healer, Restorer, Reconciler, hear our prayers for our world, our community, and for ourselves. We pray for your creation, Lord, our home and source of life. A world of so much diversity and beauty, a world of abundance that reflects your overflowing generosity and hospitality. We pray for this world as it groans under the weight of our desires and expectations for cheap energy, for cheap food, for cheap clothing, for cheap communication, for cheap living. And we know all the while that somewhere the cost for our expectations has to be paid. And too often it is paid by the very environment on which we rely, by people paid scant wages, by communities who have few choices. May we recognize the cost of our living and seek reconciliation and restoration. 
We pray for people within our communities, Lord, who know, even this very day, heartache and heartbreak, for families that have been torn apart, for relationships broken, for the burden that grief brings, for the isolation that loneliness entails, for the unwell, and for those with life-limiting illnesses. May we strive to bring healing to those who are suffering, hope to those whose dreams lie shattered, new beginning to those who are ready to give up. And may we recognize any part that we might have played in the pain of others and seek reconciliation and restoration. Now hear us, Lord, as we take time to bring to mind people and situations into which we can breathe your healing grace and move us to action. Hear our prayers, healing Lord, as we bring them to you in the name of Jesus Christ, saying the prayer that he taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus goes with you to be love in and through you and to be light in and through you today and always. Amen. <laughs>